Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be joined by Erica Maldonado. Uh, Erica, uh, good morning to you in, in the East Coast, or the West Coast I should say. Hi, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, for, for listeners, um, Eric and I uh, follow each other on Instagram uh, and uh, some people over in the UK might not be familiar with your work, Erica. Uh, you're a, a kind of ed tech online specialist, higher education particularly. Could you tell a little, a listeners a little bit more about you and uh, what you do? Yes, absolutely. So I work for an online education company called 2U and we produce, we work with universities to put their Put, to put their content online. So we have, mm -hmm. I work on the degree side, focusing on put, on putting graduate degrees online, but there are parts of the company that also focus on short courses and um, more and, and short different types of um, approaches to online learning. So I'm on the degree side and my background is my master's is, is in learning technologies. So it's really been something that I've studied, been studying for quite a while. I got that um, about 10 years ago and then I've I also have my doctorate in organizational change and leadership. And in my doctorate, I focus on training teams to build effective online learning. So wow. it's been quite a ride. I really love this field. Yeah. So, uh, well, let, let's go straight to the kind of online technology. So you've been doing that for a number of years. So um, I, I guess the switch during the pandemic, COVID, was relatively straightforward for you. And I suspect your expertise was uh, in, in great demand. Yes, absolutely. Um, I will say one thing that has that's been frustrating me about the pandemic and online learning is that because we have programs coming in, I'm not saying my company, but I'm just saying online learning as a whole, some programs have had to come into online learning so quickly and really just had to adapt to this to the technology just quickly and coming in. And I, and I think that's frustrated learners and and instructors because they've had to learn this new technology and, and really that doesn't really aid in how they teach. So why that frustrates me is because being in the field for so long, I know that to produce uh, a great high quality online course, it really takes some time. Generally, I would say about a year or so to produce something that's really great. And that's mm -hmm. because you give so much thought into making sure that the content that you're producing online for your asynchronous components they're all really tied to the goals of the course. And that mm -hmm. takes a lot of thought. Um, and then the other part of it too is planning that synchronous live session time, tying it in with the asynchronous components and then developing assessments, formative and summative that, that give the, mm -hmm. the students opportunity to really de develop their learning in the course. Um, so there's all these different components that take, take some time. So I think the pandemic, has shown us or really highlighted that mm -hmm. the online learning space, putting a course online, it isn't just turning on your camera and teaching and saying, no, hey, let's go. A, yeah, there's a lot of work <laughs> involved. Um, so in, in, in your kind of uh, experiences over the last year, uh, generally, you know, the teachers and uh, kind of colleagues or, or students even around you, um, how's the bell curve been? High anxiety, high workload at the beginning? Has it kind of settled down or is it still just as stressful? I would say it's just uh, it's just about the same. I'm <laughs> just I think the the good thing about the company that I work with now is online learning. It's really what it's it's what we do. So having more programs come in is certainly mm -hmm. um, get, giving more work to the company and kind of adds to that stress going up and down. But um, it's it's something that I think we've had to you know manage previously. Right. Um so part of, part of my show, Erica, I, I like to get to know uh, who I, I'm interviewing. Um, so I'd like to just unpick uh, your 16 year old self. What are you like at high school? In high school, high school, Erica was, I think I was reserved and um, really just finding myself. I think I was, mm -hmm. I, so one thing that I did know at that point in high school is that I did want to go into some some sort of production. Um, right. So that ended up being educational media production, working in tech. But um, I had the I was in a TV production program at my at high school, Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California. And mm -hmm. luckily, I had a really good 
TV production um, program where I was able to produce some 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 segments for our TV our, our news channel um, there, which was really fun. But high school Erica, she had a lot of growing to do. She, of course, she didn't we all do. So, um, uh, uh, what happened? I, I assume you've always been in uh, California. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, not Notre Dame University, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, High school. That's the name of the name. School. Okay. Um, so uh, the degree was in ed tech specifically? University? My, yes, my master's uh, university. So I have my bachelor's degree. Um, and you know, I'm realizing that our edu perhaps some of our education system is a bit di different. Yeah, um, so my bachelor's degree was, <laughs> was, was in social and cognitive science, and then my master's in learning technology. And then my doctorate was in organizational change and leadership. Fantastic. Now, the reason we uh, we got in touch was because um, I saw you posting a bit of content about cognitive load theory. And, and uh, prior to coming on live, we mm -hmm. uh, I, I kind of shared that a lot of uh, British teachers becoming quite interested in this cognitive mm -hmm. research. It's been around for a long, uh, you know, a number of decades. Um, could we just unpick, um, or could I ask you to maybe summarize cognitive load theory for? for busy teachers in a, in a minute or two, is that possible? Yes, absolutely. So cognitive load theory, it's really referring to the fact that our working memory can only hold so much information. And so when we're teaching, and I can talk about that, how that works, especially online, is we really want to focus on helping that working memory to really develop long-term um, concepts and to do that, we remove kind of the extra fluff from that so that mm -hmm. a learner can really retain the information. And in online learning, that's been really important or how that's applied is a few different ways. So um, I think one of the most immediate ways I can think of is when uh, instructors first start teaching online, especially developing asynchronous content, sometimes the belief is that you can just lecture for an hour or two, straight at your camera or maybe just film a lecture and, and that's great it's there for students but that's not general that's not the case especially with taking cognitive load into uh cognitive load um here and applying it so rather than lecturing for an hour or two hours or just posting something of yourself in your classroom you want to think about how you can segment the video to give the learners uh time to process and also think about how you lay up, layer um, out different, I'll say chapters, let's say of, of that hour lecture. So rather than posting that 60 minutes of one topic, let you, you want to take a look and see how can you segment it? So there's different pieces, maybe, maybe instead you, you do a five minute introduction on the topic, that's one video. The next topic is kind of setting up the concepts for it. Um, the third chapter of, of the video is, um, whatever the, the topic yeah. is and you're putting it up so that you're taking into account that learners cognitive um, load, not throwing in so much information right away. Um, and then within that content too, when developing asynchronous um, materials for online students, another way that applies is uh, we'll think about, we can think about the um, Sweller's online media principles here where really it's, it's taking con cognitive load into account so I meant I talked through. We want to be careful to not just upload an hour of video. We want to make sure it's segmented um, in different ways, into shorter chunks. You know, maybe a yeah. No, I saw you mention um, on on a post some five to seven minute uh, yeah. video clips. Yes. Is that based on the the research or analytics mm -hmm. or what people are clicking on? It is based on research. It is, uh, you can find research there. There is one uh, particular article that I have found really helpful uh, by a gentleman, Guo, G U O, um, mm -hmm. on ed edX. And he really focused those researchers. Um, and I'm sorry to not be able to give you all of the names of the researchers. That's right. We'll take them out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he really, that article really focuses on. Um, showing the data behind uh, behind that particular number. But I was going to say another another way cognitive load plays into this is um, within that video content, there's another factor you want to think about because you're not generally just talking to a camera. You might have a PowerPoint 
or mm -hmm. you know some, something resources that that help to visualize what you're speaking about so you want to also think about cognitive load in terms of those visuals and really the basis of cognitive load is removing that the those what we call extraneous factors things that really just take away from what the learner would want to grasp um, and, and keep and focus on 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 really making sure that the information those graphics or powerpoints are simple we're not having a whole bunch of text everywhere um and that you're you're being you're making sure to tailor we've them all so been that. in those lectures right with lots right of text. <laughs> and, exactly and, uh, does, uh, i'm assuming the color of the graphics or the text is also going to matter yes i can't speak i there's definitely people out there that can speak a lot better about this in terms mm -hmm. of the the colors and how that relates to different screens and what looks better but um generally you want to make sure that they're screen you know screen reader friendly uh mm -hmm. because that's actually another part about accessibility is that if we have sure. students that need to have um materials so that they're accessible on the on the um technologies that they use to access their education. Can I, um, can I um, uh, you know, general tips for high school teachers, what would be your recommendations with cognitive load in mind if they're just kind of delivering online uh, Zoom lessons? Uh, what would be your kind of top tip? Mm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, for, for the Zoom lessons and taking into account cognitive load, um, I think that, again, I can, I, you can think about, um, potentially not lecturing, you know, directly for the hour, two hours, however long that is, and instead breaking up your content into smaller pieces. And then within those chunks, you can, in your Zoom lessons, you can do breakout rooms. That's a great way to add in some active learning, creating a really a more social environment mm -hmm. for those students. Um, and then that gives you the opportunity to, to, um, to give students some um, some some problem problem based learning activities within that too. So not not only are you taking into account cognitive load by not um, like less lecturing, let's say for just an hour, but you're also giving them the opportunity to to apply their learning within breakout rooms by giving them problems based on the information that you're talking about, and then having them solve it together. Mm -hmm. within those breakout rooms uh, and do you uh you know being the ed tech specialist that you are uh, what are your particular favorite uh, pieces of technology that you uh, relied on throughout the pandemic we use um well the organization i work with has some proprietary tools that we use to build mm -hmm. out the asynchronous components of the work that the students go through so um i really use that that um a lot i think i'm trying to think of a tool that has stood out to me besides those um i might have to come back to that that's all right well, <laughs> well I'll, I'll might pick your brains at the end um, i'm really interested i've just started my doctoral studies i'm really interested to unpick yours um you mentioned educational organization teams uh yes uh -huh, organizational change and leadership now, I know this is a silly question, but just for listeners curiosity, could you give us a brief summary of um, your kind of focus and, and maybe your conclusions? I apologize for, for asking such a simple question. <laughs> no, that's not a simple question at all. I'm happy to talk about it. So the um, I was really happy. I, I will say that I um, wrestled a little bit to, to figure out which degree, which what I wanted to get my doctorate in. I knew I wanted to get it. And I thought I would get it in learning technologies, but mm -hmm. it ended up being that um, my job offered a great benefit to pay for this doctorate. And the one that was with the closest to our learning technologies was the organizational change and leadership. And I was able to talk to the program and I asked, well, can I focus my dissertation, you know, in learning technologies? And it ended up being that the, a large part of that focus of the degree was also understanding um, and knowing uh, learners and, and mo the motivation behind how we how we learn and the theories mm -hmm. behind that. So it was very, very applicable. So my dissertation, I focused on um, building uh, or in my, by the way, it's an EDD. So I focused yeah. really on building a framework for um, training teams on building effective learning technology so really laying laying out that whole um 
that whole structure. So, um, so back to the question of what the what it was exactly is generally um, building building teams really is mm -hmm. is the, was the program really is building organization. Well, I'm, I'm doing an EDD time. and it's about your actual okay. practice. So did you do it full time, okay. part time? Full time, full time. So that was so it was great because I actually um, during my ADD I used my department for that. So when I say right. I, I I built for my dissertation I had to build some really a lot of, of that course. training. Use, use, use your resources around you. Yes. Uh huh. So I was um, able to interview a lot of people in my department, figure out where the gaps were in the organizations. Mm -hmm. So it was a big part of it, is identifying what the gap is in sure. the team and 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 what the vision and goals are of um, a department. So I was able to identify that. And then the result was building a, I was able to, to with the, my colleagues, build a course that focused on training um, the course development team on principles that are important. Because one thing I did identify actually in this part, which was interesting, is that the way our, our course developers on our team, and the, just to reiterate, the the team that I work on that I manage, they're course developers that they work together with university faculty to, to put university degrees online. And so we work really closely with them to develop, um, talk through what their goals are of the course and talk through what are the best modalities to produce to, to create these great courses. So one thing that I realized when I was talking to a lot of people is that the way we define success in, in developing these courses generally was, are the faculty happy at the end of the course development with right. process? But yes, that is a, that is a def, definitely a big success metric, especially in terms of business, but really at the end of the day, the students are the success metric is, are we reaching the, are we making sure that the students are learning what they're supposed to be learning? And so that mm -hmm. was part of the switch that I wanted to make or that we needed to make in the department was making sure that the success metric was was not only um, highlighting the 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 um, satisfaction of the people that we're working with, but also that we're highlighting in the department that um, achieving the the students' academic goals sure. were part of. Now it sounds um very fascinating. Uh, when, when did you complete uh, your studies? 2018, so almost okay, three so years ago. Relatively recently. Now, um, mm -hmm. a lot of teachers here in the UK are getting really excited about uh, getting <laughs> interested in research. Uh, what would be your top tip for a teacher who's maybe a kind of kind of bachelor degree level, maybe a master's degree, and, and wants to start to get into some academic research, you know, particularly Sweller's paper, for example? Um, what mm -hmm. would be your tip for those busy people? <sighs> their tips um I have it's hard for me to say that because it's a tip because I think I've I have been bad at taking my own tip because oh. I have gotten myself sucked into a lot of research articles yeah. just downloading them and trying to synthesize things even if they didn't really relate to what I had to do for schoolwork because there there is some exciting things out there um, okay, so for starters, I might say go into Google Scholar and look up mm -hmm. something that's interesting to you. So mm -hmm. for me, at one point, it was really digging into uh, cognitive load and understanding video metrics and online learning. So I think zoning in on a topic that's interesting mm -hmm. to you and then really digging into the research on that. Um, and then Very actually, this is, part, <laughs> this is part of why I started my Instagram feed and providing some of those visualizations that are important in online learning because I did start to realize that there it, there are a lot of resources building up and we don't always have a lot of time to read all the research mm -hmm. and sometimes it's just easier to get you know a quick visualization and, and to understand how we can apply that so that was actually part of the inspiration of why I, I started to create some of those Right. It's, it's really interesting. And particularly in a world now where, you know, social media dominates us all and, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of swipe up feature, the six second tick. I used to use Vine a number of years ago and that was a six second oh, video. Wow. <laughs> that shows you how old it is. And, uh, you know, now there's TikTok back and you can do all sorts of things and uh, you can see them all emerging. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, uh, I guess one question that I always ask uh, people that I work with is, um, you know, on kind of workload uh 
you know, we know teachers are very busy people. And, and I guess in your context, online educators and things like that, um, the, the challenge would be slightly different, but broadly the same, you know, delivering lessons, lots of students, those types of things. What, what workload pressures uh, face, you know, professors, lecturers working in an online higher education tech world? Are they the same as the kind of typical physical classroom mm -hmm. or, or are there discrete differences? That's a great question. And that's interesting because the, most, of the, most of the faculty that we work with actually also teach on ground. So right. they're, develop, they're, develop, they're teaching on ground and then also teaching online and then doing research. And if they're not professors that do uh, research for schools then they're practitioners, so they're, they're busy with their real jobs. What, one thing I, that I do love, even though it, is, it does make it a lot of work for professors is that when they're teaching on ground and online, one piece of feedback that I've really loved hearing is when they come back and say, this was a lot of work, but I'm actually a better instructor because I had to teach online. Because when you, um, when you teach, when you are almost kind of forced to, you know, really plan out every single part of your, your um, online, online course, because you're developing asynchronous components, it really mm -hmm. kind of, I, I think helps professors to really outline where those really fit into the, the, go the goals for their students. Mm -hmm. And then also kind of forces the brain to um, think through more of what they're doing on the synchronous component too. So there's just a lot more tying things together. Yeah. So I'm really glad that I've been talking to you because I, I've been trying to do an online course for years. I've got loads of, of resources and materials. Um, and now I've got my website in a place where I can actually deliver one of my kind of core uh, books or teacher resources called Mark Plan Teach. And essentially there's 30, I, there's 30 core ideas in the book, but I, I suspect in each chapter alone of the book and the resources, there's lots of ideas inside. So I, I'm hearing you hit loudly that I need to create lots of five, you know, five, seven minute videos and maybe divide one idea into maybe five or six little chunk mm -hmm. the mic is that is that would i be on the right track there yeah mm -hmm. absolutely so there's a huge workload ahead uh, <laughs> ahead for me isn't there <laughs> um, yes uh, so uh, you know what with your work i know you know pandemic aside uh, with your work with you know your own organization and others can you give us just general insights maybe not to do with the covid but just generally how people are you know where where's where's the kind of future where where are things emerging uh, what are the kind of general things that people ask you to do? Uh, the kind of, maybe the kind of barriers that, that kind of unleash uh, people's potentials in organizations. What, what are your insights and patterns that you see? Sure. So I, um, so I, I work with a team, I oversee a team that works with faculty across several different universities to, um, to put their degrees and courses online. And I love that. Another part of my job that I love is that I was able to work on a project where to get the, to actually get those data sets to, to show how students are engaging with video. And that has been incredible mm -hmm. to see. Um, and we're starting to use those insights to guide how we, how we continue the conversations with universities. And um, generally speaking, where I see trends going is that I see a huge opportunity to use that data, whether it be that, um, or also really starting to pull in. Uh, another part, of, another thing that I do want to mention too is that there are online learning rubrics out there, and I think that there's work, more work that can be done to mm -hmm. even enhance how those work for for building online degrees so where i see the future of this is pulling in data pulling in data as it relates to the rubrics also um, to really see how we can be more effective online and then going down the line i think that there's going to be some work some more work in the vr world um, mm -hmm. and applying that to online learning too i haven't really seen it pop up in anything that i'm mm -hmm. doing but i think there's going to be um, some really neat things happening guess, there uh, one last question you know as a result of the pandemic and us all working at home or online well, once we do return to normal we're all back out you know at, at schools cafes you know shopping those types yeah. of things 
What, what do you think the one thing in education might stick? I think online learning will stick. I mean, I mean, it is going to stick. And that's one thing that I, I like to reflect on is that the interest in distance learning, this it's nothing new. Online learning is nothing new. Distance mm. learning, there's an interest in that. I think it was somewhere in the 18, 1800s, no internet back then, but, you know, mailing back and forth to, yeah. to engage with ac academics that were far away. And then we all, we all know, um, well, at least here at the University of, of Phoenix was a big thing. And all we've done is continue to evolve. The mm. pandemic has just put a microscope, a big lens on this, but when life goes back to normal, online learning, it, it's still going to grow because there's so much still to be to be done yeah. um, in education. If anything, every teacher around the world's had to fast track their skills very quickly. Haven't yeah. They? <laughs> and I guess all our children have got that kind of uh, resilience and those skills very early on, much, much quicker than uh, maybe you and I didn't have until our uh, oh mid-20s, perhaps. Um, so but, it's how they learn. This, yeah, this TikTok exciting. generation. <laughs> We're going to have to all do TikToks, I think, to be great instructors. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it's really interesting to see how that's changed. You know, when I think of my 10 year old son, you know, if I show him some YouTube videos that I'm editing myself, obviously they're education. So sometimes the topics are a bit dry to him, but um, there'll be the occasional one that he's hooked in. Uh, so, Dad, oh, that's a really good start. And then after five seconds, he's gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> So Erica, um, you know, we've done about 25 minutes, which is, you know, my podcast optimum time. Um, uh, so I, I tend to throw some quick fire questions to people that I'm uh, interviewing. Uh, so you can't pause or hesitate. And I want to see if I can catch you off guard and, and okay. uh, catch you out. So uh, an easy question uh, to begin with today. Um, I know it's very early in the morning for you. What project are you working on uh, this morning? This desk. morning, I am working on a program that is a is a physical therapy program um, at a university, and um, so really just working on the different complexities. Fun fact: putting physical therapy degrees is quite online is quite a beast. <laughs> Yeah. Now, um, uh, we haven't really talked about um, the an organization you work for. Is it Cal Calicia Care? Oh, okay. So Calicia Care is actually a separate uh, a company that I'm working on with my sister. I work for um, a company called 2U, and that's the one that I work with to um, put with my team that puts um, degrees online. Calicia Care is um, a post-op recovery business. My sister right. is a nurse. And so um, I'm, I'm working on that together with her, and I'm really excited to okay, be great. Some on, online potential there as well. Um, what do you do to relax? Mm -hmm. What do I do to relax? That's interesting because I have not relaxed this whole week. <laughs> um, I like I love going on walks with my dog. That's my favorite. Yeah, no, I spotted your dog. Uh, what what what's your dog uh, type of dog you have? He's a Havapu. He's Havanese and Poodle. Oh, fantastic! Um, if I uh, haven't been to LA for a long time, probably twenty years. Um, if I came for uh, 24, 48 hours, where would we go? What would we do? And what would we eat? We would go to a, we'd probably go to something like, um, I really love Synespia. It is, it's something they do outdoor movie nights. And so right now with the pandemic, they've been bringing back the drive, drive in right. concept. So students bring, sorry, students, you can go with your car and watch a movie. And I love that. So um, pre pandemic, you'd be able to watch a movie at the Hollywood Cemetery, bring out a blanket bring your own food your own snacks and they put um, movies up on there okay what would what be on would, the menu what would be on the menu oh, that's <laughs> tough what would be on the menu okay <sighs> um man i think that I'm supposed to answer these. I'm supposed to answer these fast. Yeah, well, that's um, all right. I mean, I'm hoping it's more than a you know, a, there are a lot of preconceptions about burgers in America, isn't there? But you got. I know. I was gonna say. Food. I was gonna say In and Out, but that's so basic. Everyone goes <laughs> In and Out is the huge thing in LA. Everyone does that. No, it it would be something to do with an outdoor patio and. Oh, okay, great. Um, great cocktails. Who who's your kind of key person to follow on Instagram? I know you're an an avid Instagram user. Who's your go-to person? My go-to... Um, a bit of inspiration. You know, I honestly have a few. I don't have just um, one person. I've really been enjoying making friends on Instagram. So mm -hmm. I can't... I don't think I would just say one. It's been fun to just 
figure out and delve in people who are kind of okay. in, in education and, and taking great connections um cognitive mm -hmm. load description in less than 10 words keep it simple <laughs> Okay, fantastic. Really, really simple. Um, okay, um, what book are you reading at the moment? Um, I have a couple of really great books. One is right there, and it's actually a really basic one. It's called Chicken Soup for what's what's the title? Chicken Soup for the Soul: Living Your Dreams, and they're really yeah. beautiful stories of people who are living their dreams. And um, I've really enjoyed one of the the best exercises in the beginning of that book, actually. Not only to talk about a lot about visualization and all the stories include that one of the best things that I did in the, during this pandemic because of this book is that it told you in the beginning take out all those little things in your life that kind of bug you a little bit mm -hmm. you know and it just makes your mind a lot happier and clearer so I had us do a lot of little fixes around the home probably like every yeah month. no me too uh, I mean <laughs> oh, chicken soup things. actually if you want a really good chicken soup you have to take out all the little pieces and uh, when yeah. I left full-time teaching to become uh, you know what I do now um one of the first things I did was make a real good chicken soup uh, and then oh. inspired by another friend who left full-time teaching and did the same and it's kind of a we know chicken soup's good for the soul it's good to heal you make you feel very homely and uh, especially if you're not feeling well so uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's a great book a really good top tip and um, what's your biggest career achievement to date Most i would viral. say i mean i mentioned the video data project that i that i got for um and my current role at 2u that was a humongous accomplishment for me um mm -hmm. just being able to navigate and figure out how to pull all of those metrics out for um all of the programs that two you works with so you can with this data we can you can go into the back end of this and see video engagement across every single program and every single video fantastic and um, post lockdown where where's your first vacation <sighs> i think that i it's a toss up between japan or the maldives Okay, well, that, that's a really tough decision. Okay, mm -hmm. um, I, I know we're mid 2021, but well, let's let's push you a bit further. What would what's your predicted trend in education 2022? At least the, in America. Uh -huh, I think there's going to be more opportunities for students to pursue education outside of the traditional degree. Okay, um, who would you in, recommend I interview next and why? Hmm. Have you brought in Ronaldo? No, not yet. I know Ronaldo really well. We haven't caught up physically, obviously, for a, 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 a while. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll hook up with Ronaldo because I know he's also an ed tech uh, guru uh, here in the yeah, UK. Yeah, Ronaldo so that's, a, that's a great recommendation. Um, where can listeners find out more about you online, Erica? Sure. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram. So it's Dr. Erica Maldonado. So D R E R I K A M A L D O N A D O. And so I've really been working on there to, like I mentioned, post a lot more easy to um, easy to grasp images related to online learning. Fantastic. And my final question is a deep one. This. Um, what do you hope to be your legacy? I want to, it's, and it's nice that you asked this because I've really been reflecting on this so much lately. Um, oh, I right. think when you asked about 16 year old Erica, 16 year old Erica didn't have really very many or any um, women of color in positions that could, that were inspiring to her. And mm -hmm. so I want to be that for girls at that age. And, and so everything that I do, I, I want to, well, to I'm, be. I, I'm absolutely confident you're already uh, doing that, Erica. So um, that's a fantastic answer. Um, so that brings us to the end of our podcast, everybody. Um, you've been listening to Ross from Teacher Toolkit, and I've been uh, having a lovely chat with Erica Maldonado from uh, California. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, Keep up the amazing work.